Hey everyone, welcome to the Slice of Healthcare podcast. I'm your host, Jared Taylor. Joining me today is the CEO and founder of Baton Health, Robert Coombs. How's it going? Yeah, it's great to be here. Yeah, it's good to see you. I've, you and I, have we, we've chatted before, but we've only quickly ran into each other once at a conference, um, you know, hoping to, to run into you at, at some of these upcoming events and we, we can chat some more, but this is a good start. Um, would love to kind of hear first your background, tell the audience a little bit about your background and then we'll dig into Baton Health. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I have a, a, a little bit of a, a, a non-traditional um, background for a a healthcare tech CEO. I actually spent most of my um, my career in nonprofits and politics. So uh, my experience is in um, uh, working with folks in in regulatory spaces, um, operating from like a really lean perspective, and trying to figure out how you can do more with less. Um, I actually got my start in this space at a, a very small CBO. Uh, at the time, it was called Cred Simple. They were doing about 200 credentials a month. Uh, I helped to scale them up to a, about 15,000 credentials a month on average. Uh, they peaked at 25,000 credentials in a single month. Um, and I learned a lot in that process. We, we rebranded as Andros, pretty well-known name in the space. Um, uh, took over network development, um, all of the uh, recruiting and contracting for building out payer networks. We were able to automate a lot of that workflow as well. Um, but, you know, taking a company from a relatively small, um, very, very manual process to, uh, you know, one of the largest around, um, you really learn how to optimize workflows and how much, um, manual work is still left in the process. And so that's kind of how I started my, my path towards Baton is, um, you know, I've seen how big, uh, the problem of credentialing is and. And, and how manual it still is. And I think that there are opportunities for us to, um, to, to build solutions that can be the rising tide that lifts all boats. You know, when you hear these stories, Robert, uh, you know, you, I always hear the pain point and then people decide to start the company. But when I hear it in the credentialing space and I say, and you still wanted, knowing the pain point, you still wanted to go and start. It's, it's a different response from me because um, you and I, we, we talked about this at one point and, and I talk, I use this analogy a lot, but the credentialing space and licensing, it's kind of like banging your head off a table over and over again in many cases. And, um, in the past, when the solution came along, you just put the pillow there. It doesn't necessarily solve it. It just, uh, you know, makes it a little bit more comfortable. Um, even after all these pain points and your experience in doing this, like, let's talk about it because if you, I know if, if someone's going to go at it, like, like you're going at it, you're going to come at it from a different angle. So talk us through that different angle and, and, and kind of why that played a role in saying, all right, let's, let's build a solution for this. Yeah. I mean, my experience, it, it started at Andros. Um, I, I actually went on to, uh, work at a company called Medallion, uh, help them raise some money and stand up some teams. And, um, and that was the, there was like a, an epiphany that I had having seen this a second time. And I've also gone on to um, advise and consult for a whole bunch of other players in the space. And it turns out that um, the problems that I faced at each of those companies were almost identical. Um, you have companies that are out there in a very competitive market that have to be faster and be better uh, than all of the others, and yet they have the exact same raw materials to work with. Um, you have data coming from more than a thousand distinct databases, many of them as old as I am, um, really terrible uh, interfaces, virtually no APIs uh, out there. And so how do you solve that problem? Well, you got to throw bodies at the, at the problem. And so everybody's kind of operating from the same playbook behind the scenes, right? We uh, we know that there's still so much manual data entry that has to happen. So you're going to have more people to do that manual data entry and try to give them the best care and feeding that you can. But the reality is all of the engineering time, all the product time is going into the facade um, that we're putting out there for, um, uh, for, for customers. And I don't blame anyone. It's literally the very best play that you can take if you want to be a CVO, if you want to build out um, credentialing software platforms, 
Um, honestly, if you're in other spaces that are using this data, it's the best thing that you can do. You got to fake it to make it. Um, I take a very different approach and I want to go headlong at the hardest problem. Um, because if we can solve that, uh, we can, again, we can be a utility that is out there for everybody. And so we took a very narrow approach. What other folks have done is they've said for an individual credential file, how is, how can I get each of the pieces the fastest? Uh, how can I train my team to go out there and find it uh, really quickly, do a little bit of uh, data validation? What we're doing is the opposite. We're going out there and we're gathering every single primary source, uh, verific every single piece of primary source information that exists for the entire industry, for everybody in the healthcare, every healthcare provider in every geography. And we think that by amassing this huge federated data set, it unlocks all sorts of really interesting opportunities. We can do primary source verification faster and more accurately than anybody in the industry. Um, but we also have unique insight where rather than waiting for a practitioner to tell us what licensure they have, we already know, right? It unlocks capabilities like being able to go out there and find practitioners who have the licensure that we want rather than recruiting practitioners and trying to build up their licensure after we've uh, already spent time with them. Um, so at any rate, I, I, it's just, a fundamentally different approach, sort of a brute force approach. Um, but we think that there's really great opportunity to go back there and support, um, like the people that I've worked with in the past, CVOs, uh, hospitals, health systems, payers, anybody who needs um, uh, a lot of uh, primary source information um, in, uh, in a really tight package. That's what we're here for. Now, in your, in your go-to-market, you initially you were giving out a free resource right to kind of before before you formally launched um congratulations by the way yeah. um thank you and talk me through i i know you like to kick things off you've been doing a lot kind of in the digital that virtual care digital health space um you know we, we had uh, like in terms of go to market that was a similar approach um and and i probably i probably know why you're doing this but i would love to hear from you you know why w initially do you like kind of that space to start offering a solution? Yeah, a, a couple of things. I, I do want to go back to our, our the free tool. Um, so we built out an, a national credentialing directory. Um, and uh, that was a little bit of a passion project for me. I've had to build out a directory of primary sources many times over now. Um, every single time you go into a CVO or someone is doing peer enrollment, you got to build that list over again. And it just shocked me that nobody had made one of those public. And the reason is it's hard to justify um, monetizing that. And so I just said, we're going to make it available for free. Anybody who's out there needing to like Google, where do I find uh, chiropractic licenses for West Virginia? Um, they've, they've had that experience of wasting time on their PSV work, just trying to find where the data is. We can get you there in two clicks. Um, more than 350 people are using that tool. Um, we didn't have to market it. They came to us because it's something that was needed. And so it was our, our first taste of really solving one of the dumbest problems in healthcare. Uh, so we're following that with the next dumbest problem in healthcare. And that is, um, how do you get data from a thousand databases in one location? Um, so the reason we went after virtual care um, in the early stages is number one, they're innovators. Um, they are uh, much more likely to be early adopters than some of the legacy players in healthcare. Um, we are starting to see hospitals and health systems and payers that are recognizing like, wait a second, there's a faster way to do this. And so um, we're excited about that growth, but the virtual care, um, uh, they've been the, the first to raise their hands and, and also they have the, the most pain, right? Um, if you have a brick and mortar healthcare facility, your practitioners might have a couple or a few licenses. In virtual care, they have tens of licenses. Um, we actually did a, a time study with a, a very early adopter, National Virtual Care Delivery Network, and uh, they had 9,000 practitioners, um, many of them with upwards of 50 licenses. We were able to light match every single license that exists in under four minutes. But it was when they pulled a single practitioner that we saw the real speed. They pulled a single practitioner at random. She had 33 state licenses. And they estimate that it takes them about six hours every time they credential that person just to enter the license information. 
their licensing team touches every license uh, at least once per year. So they're at 12 hours of PSV for credentialing and another 12 to 15 hours just for monitoring. We query that practitioner in 645 milliseconds. So we are tens of thousands of times faster and it's especially important when you have those folks who have lots and lots of licenses or you need to touch them multiple times. It just becomes a no brainer um, that accessing it this way makes a lot more sense. I love it. And um, you, you recently, um, what's it called? It was t sorry, talk me through the healthcare professionals that the platform can kind of handle today. Yeah, um, most, most folks in credentialing really focus on primarily on physicians. And that makes a lot of sense. It's uh, at least a third of most credentialing is MDs, DOs, and PAs. Um, as a result, there's been a lot less work to optimize credentialing for uh, nurses, for allied care professionals. You know, behavioral health is like a big one. It was one of the first things to go virtual. Um, they have lots and lots of licenses and there's just like not a lot of services out there that specialize in that. And so rather than taking a targeted approach and saying, we're gonna deliver better credentialing uh, experience for physicians, we said, we are going to solve this problem for the entire industry, for every provider of every kind. Um, and it's unlocked all sorts of things. People are now using us as a hiring screen because rather than spending the time on their practitioners only to find out that, they're, that they don't have the licenses that they need or they've got a bad mark on their record, we can actually give them an instantaneous view of what they're inevitably going to see. Save them a bunch of time. Um, being able to go and have an optimized search for the practitioners that you want, um, rather than just hanging up a, a job description and saying, please come to us if you have lots of licenses, we can actually identify the folks who already have the licensure that you need. Um, in virtual and telehealth, we think about licensure like inventory. So it's not necessarily the number of practitioners that you have on your roster. It's the number of licenses that you have coverage for. And so we can actually give you uh, an optimized view uh, of that. So that's been our, our thinking. That's been how we've gone about it. So rather than trying to isolate uh, a few distinct practitioners, uh, we just decided to go after everybody that exists. I love it. Um... And, and, and I want to thank you for your approach. Um, we're not going to, we don't, we don't call people out on the, on this show, but um, I mean, some people might be able to put two and two together, but uh, when, when you kind of look at this space, cause we went up against it too, right. In the early days is um, you know, it, it takes a lot to uh, continue to stay on that path of like, you know, I know this is from, from you know, the conversation that you and I had before this, um, you know, you're, you're very truthful. Like you want to stick with like, Hey, we're going to put out there what we, we can actually do. And this is an approach that we're going to continue on throughout the life cycle of the company. Cause particularly in this space, I feel like it, it's very easy. This is not to knock anyone. It's very easy to, you know, to try to get ahead, to say that things are further along. Cause it gets people excited. People want a salute. It, it, it's more, more to the space of saying people want, a that, that really great solution. It's very painful. So when you can tell them something more, but we know what happens with that. It, it can, you know, when you set expectations up here and they come in here, it's tough to recover from that. But, um, so thank you for, you know, running a, a clean, clean company and, and taking that approach. Um, what, what are you like most looking forward to? What can you share with us here today in terms of what's next for the company? Um, I know, launch just recently happened. So there, there's a lot, but uh, kind of share whatever you can with us. Yeah. Um, well, first, you know, th thank you for recognizing that. I mean, I, I think that we've carved a hard, harder path out for ourselves, but it will make things easier because people know exactly what they're getting. Uh, they, they don't get disappointed. And I won't have to do all of the work that goes into um, recouping the trust uh, that was lost. Like people, um, People have had some some hard experiences in this space, and I I, I just want to do things differently. Um, what I'm excited about is uh, I, I would say there are a lot of things. A couple of things come to mind. The the short term is we get to see people putting this in practice, and it is wild. We had the the um, the, the CMO of the clinic by by Cleveland Clinic. That's their their virtual second opinion um, uh, practice. He came back to us and he said, "You just did." 
in 24 hours what it would have taken us 45 years. Um, what, uh, what a testimonial. Now, in fairness, uh, that was super exaggerated. It wouldn't have taken them 45 years, but it might have taken them a couple. Um, and it didn't take us 24 hours. It took us five minutes, right? That's, that is so special when you can see you know, people's eyes uh, widen because they've never seen anything like this. But honestly, it's the way that things should be, right? We should be able to have a comprehensive view of someone's licensure with a single NPI search. So that gets me to the second thing that's really exciting. We're starting with licensure. Next up is sanctions, exclusions, boards. We're going to chip away until we have every single element of the credentialing file. Um, and again, there are these other workflows that can also leverage some of this data. So now imagine that we're pulling this data. Right now we're pulling it uh, every two weeks. Uh, the average age or freshness of our data is seven days. So imagine that you have all of the data required for credentialing and each element is being uh, updated on a daily or weekly or monthly basis. The reality of real-time credentialing is near. Um, you can start to take that uh, incredibly fresh, accurate, comprehensive data and simply apply your business logic to it and know instantaneously whether or not this person can be approved into your network. Know instantaneously whether or not you can put this person in front of your committee. Um, that is only possible with the approach that we're taking. You can't do that without knowing all of that information in advance. And so um, the, the use cases are extremely exciting to me and um, the, the innovators that are gonna take advantage of this data. What we've done is novel, but what other people are gonna do with this data is really gonna be extraordinary. And I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to see it happen. Well, I'm excited to, to stay in touch and continue to follow along with the progress. And uh, thank you for, for doing this. This is definitely, this was a different approach that, uh, than, than we took. Um, and, and I know a lot of others have, so uh, kudos to you for, for, for mixing it up and take, and that's what it needs to, is it needs a different approach. Um, Cause you know, I, I still have the, the scar on the, on the forehead from hitting my head off uh, yeah. the, the table and, and I'm not Harry Potter. So it, it's not, it's not a good look. Right. Um, but, uh, no, thank you for what you're doing. We'll, we'll continue to stay in touch. Um, please let us know when updates come up and, uh, you know, keep, keep grinding. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, excited to, to meet some of your listeners out in the wor world. We're going to be at a hip. Uh, uh, you can find us at batonhealth.com. Thanks, Robert. Thank you.